you know, there's something about starting out walking in the vineyards through the summer, seeing the grapes come in, and you know, over time, slowly, over two years, you can make this fantastic product that tastes just like this little corner in this year of your life. It's great. Yeah, it's tasting the grapes. So like, I had no idea for winemaking. And when we were gonna, decided to have a winery, you know, it's like we take classes. Yeah, sure, okay. Oh, the chemistry of wine. <laughs> Whatever, I never took chemistry in high school, <laughs> let alone college. But then you taste the grapes yeah. in the vineyard. And you're like, okay, really acid, acid burn, blah, to, oh my God, this tastes so good. It's so sweet. And then you bring it in the winery and then it goes from really sweet and juicy and lush to really kind of interesting as it sort of ferments to really horrid, nasty as it finishes, you know, primary ferment. And then it goes through this other year and a half of just changing so much and it ends up being really beautiful. So, we've given up our lives to do this. <laughs> yeah, and it was really, I mean, the, speaking of the, the transformation that the ferments go through, um, in 03 when we started our winery, I'd, I'd, I'd actually work harvest for a bunch of wineries starting in 96, so I could see all this stuff before. 03 was Athena's first year going from start to finish, front to back. Um, and there were a lot of, it was the, the for those, if you, if you guys have tasted new wines before, like new wine straight out of the fermenter, not so much the thing you want to sit down and, and drink a bottle of. Um, and there's this transformation where you lose that last few percent sugar where you go from this fantastic sweet beverage to this thing that's just lean and angular. And, um, and so I yelled at Stuart a lot the first year <laughs> in front of other winemakers because I, I remember, like, you ruined the wine. <laughs> and I remember other winemakers like stopped in the winery and just looked, you know, like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. He really ruined the wine. Meanwhile, I didn't know what I was talking about. And over the course of the year, you know, when the wine went through the secondary ferment and age, and then it ended up being really gorgeous and lush, and it just wasn't sweet, but it was heinous. <laughs> but I still do that. That's just me. Athena doesn't like the wine right after primary ferment. Yeah. And that's why I love working on the wines now. I climb these barrels, and I get my head in the barrels, and I stir them up, and I get all the smells and I bump them because these things are really, really sharp. So I bump my head and my, the bruises still. But it's worth it because you get to see how everything changes. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, the flip side of this whole thing, so Athena went from 03 where she was yelling at me because she thought I'd ruin the wine to today she's basically the cellar master and runs all the day-to-day -day stuff in the, in the winery. Um, yeah, I went from having a lab, watching people use software and hardware, documenting everything they did, writing reports, giving them to the engineers to, you know, change the way, where they put that little green on button on the this or that or the software, to, um, to hiding away in the cellar and driving a forklift. So, <laughs> so what, um, so you, you, you made this transformation and probably took a few risks along the way to, in order to do that, so, um, what was, um, did you have a certain wine experience or was there a certain wine that you had at one point that really turned your head that um, made you want to do this? Yeah. Several. It was the wine experience. It was the Pinot Noirs that were so layered. There was, like, I don't know, it was like the slow transformation of just realizing that you can smell this wine and it changes so much. It's like a really interesting novel. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. And, and, and honestly, the, the decision to, to jump in and, bait, you know, I mean, I worked for free for people for five harvests just to really learn, you know, learn right next to, to good winemakers because that's, I mean, that's how you learn to make Pinot in Oregon. And it was really driven by that first year in 96 when I walked in and just the, the smells that waft over you when you walk into a, a winery that's fermenting Pinot in the middle of harvest, there's nothing like it on the planet. And, and watching that, again, that's that transformation from this tiny patch of hillside over here all the way into bottle and how it's just completely different than this tiny patch of hillside over here all the way into bottle. Yeah, so it's, we grow the grapes here, so we get to be a part of everything. The vineyard, the growth, and the 
the winemaking and then all of it. So you, you decided to move uh, your winery location to Portland. So uh, what's the idea different from what folks might be doing out in the valley? You know, you know it's funny, the, the, the bulk of the year, it, it's a winery. From when the grapes show up out front until the bottles leave, it's just like a winery anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, we've got the same equipment, the same facility. Actually, in a lot of ways, it's easier because we're all inside, so we're not freezing outside during the fall. Um, and for us, we, we like living in the city. We like living in Portland. It's a fantastic place to live. And by moving the winery here, we can go out to the vineyards during the year a few times a month or you know, when we get closer to harvest a few times a week. But then the rest of the year, we're, 10 minute, we're a 10 minute drive rather than an hour and 10 minute drive to the winery. You know, so, it's, so it's a lot smaller footprint just on the driving back and forth. And it's so much easier to say, I want to just bop over to the winery to do this that I forgot to do yesterday. Um, it gives us a lot more time and focus on the winemaking because we don't have to, we don't have to stress out and think about it as much. Yep. And then like, you know, from the seller master experience, <laughs> If I run out of supplies, any supplies, they're max 10 minutes away. Run out of nitrogen gas, I got my forerunner, I drive around the block and I can get that, you know, so everything is right here. But urban, suburban, rural, it doesn't matter. You build a good winery with the right equipment and you make good wine. So um, I'll just ask you again, I know I already asked you, but yeah. just what you did before you started making wine and um, you know, what prompted the transformation? Yeah, so, so my, my background is in physics and engineering. Um, I did a lot of microlithography. So I did imaging, um, absolutely nothing to do with this. And it was funny, Athena was talking about the chemistry and winemaking stuff. I was one of those physics guys during college. I like hated the chemistry classes. I took just what I had to take because it's like, what do I need this for? I had physics. Um, and, and I love the science side of things, but the jobs you get with that, it, you know, I got a great job, but it was, you're way far removed from end product for the effort that you're putting in. Um, and this, this, gave, this gave me a way to basically start with grapes on the back of a truck, and I, and I influence the thing the whole way through, and I see it, and I hold the bottle at the end of the day and go out and sell it, pour it for people. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic way to live. Well, you own it. Yeah. Every bit of it. I take responsibility for anything that went wrong, anything. If it went right, I'm just really happy to weather. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're part of every step. So it's actually, it's, I don't know what it is. It's kind of, it's silly, it's magical. But, it, but it's, all, I mean, it's, it's also, you're, we're creating this product that people have this visceral reaction to. One, I mean, one way or the other. I mean, they like our style, they don't like our style, but I mean, we, we pour people a glass of our wine and they're like, you know, I mean, they have this gut instinctual reaction to the product versus the, I made this cool widget, yeah. which, you know, enhances people's lives and everything, but it's, it's that, it's, you don't get that personal connection. And was there anything else that prompted you to make that switch, you know, of when, uh, was, there, was there a moment when you realized, okay, we're going to do this now? You know, we got to the point in our careers where we were pretty happy with the careers. You know when you're in school, you're studying, you're learning, you're pushing, you have that end goal, and then you start off in your career, and you're like, I'm learning, I'm figuring out where I am, and then at a certain point, it's like, I'm here, I'm happy. But I love working in a cubicle, and I love the people I'm working with, and I, you know, like, working in high tech, everything's changing, but gosh, I want to continue to learn. And with the wine, you don't ever know everything. You cannot predict everything. You don't have control. So we were, at, I think, at the point in our careers, we were like, OK, I'm grown up. I know I can do this. Now I want to do something else and kind of like live down and dirty again, real physical. Sure. Yeah. So um, what about, again, some of those is there a, a bottle of wine that turned your head in that time period or, or something? Do you remember anything or just maybe even individually, what was the first time you really became aware of wine as something more than just, um, you know, a beverage or is there 
Do you have that bottle that stands out in your memory or a turning point? For me, it was an evolution, you know. It wasn't like that aha moment. It wasn't like my first kiss. It was <laughs> just kind of over time, just kind of matured into this point where I, I just went, wow, this is all part of my life. I want to be really just engrossed in this. So no, it wasn't that one bottle for me. How about you? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was probably, I don't know, if I, if I think back, it's, I've always been interested in food and flavors and flavor combinations. I mean, I can remember back when I was a kid, like helping my mom cook, helping, um, and figuring out flavor combinations and playing around with things and, and that hands-on direct experiential thing. And it translated over directly into wine when I started drinking wines. And, you know, I mean, it's kind of like everybody else. I started out drinking fairly inexpensive Chardonnays and Rieslings and, um, you know, and I had some experiences in California, I had some experiences in Europe, tasting some fantastic wines, but it was just kind of this cumulative effect and um, wanting to be able to get to the point where I was part of that, yeah. part of creating that. You want to make the best wine that you possibly can make. Just, because there are so many good wines. There's so many awesome Pinots that are actually made here by different winemakers. And what they do affects the wine and just to be a part of that was really more exciting than just having one glass. It was like having, you know, when you do their tastings and we have our 20 glasses and we taste through all the wines and we say, I know what this guy did and I don't know what that guy did. Oh, I do and he tweaked this from this and this. Being a part of that, that was the experience for me. Now, you're both uh, winemakers. So, um, and how, are, how do your wine styles differ? Sometimes I think it's a little bit of a personality that comes through in the wine, and I laugh because I'm five feet tall. <laughs> and I realized this a while ago. But you do talk with your background. hands a lot. I know, I'm Greek, I've got Greek, and I've got a bit of that short person personality, so I like bigger, bolder. So my pinots tend to be a little fruitier, a little bigger, bigger tannins, um, a little spicier. And I can tell you what I think Stu's are. Uh, Go for it. I, I think like, <laughs> Stu is, because he's a physicist, he really likes the refined and the elegant. And then he always looks pained when I say that. No, it's, I mean, it's not that. It's, it's more, um, it's more the, the precision aspect of it. So less of the, less of the big mid palate fruit, more of the precision on the acid fruit balance, a little bit lighter fruit, more pretty aromatics. I mean, so it's, it's the lighter of the two wines, but I, I mean, I prefer it. Um, it, it, and it's, and it. Again, you taste them side by side, there's definitely a winery style to our wines. Um, they're basically, the fermentations are very similar. The, they're both in barrel for a year and a half. Everything's fairly similar, but the vineyards they come from are completely different. Um, you know, the bigger, bolder Dijon clone stuff all goes to Athena. I get the higher elevation stuff that has these cool high tone aromatic notes, but not the big fruit to back it up, uh, which honestly makes it more fun for both of us because we get to see fruit come in from all over the place. Is there any sort of a rivalry then? I, I don't know if you go into competitions or you send your wines out to different, do you, do you have a, <laughs> a friendly rivalry going or? Yeah, we don't mean to, but it never seems like we get the same kind of the exact number reviews. Like every year we'll like bounce back and forth. So we submit our wines to our industry, you know, critics just as a way to say, are we on the right track? And then it seems like we take turns every year, 91, 92, 90, you know, and it's just close enough just to kind of go, oh, just, but, but it's, I mean, the, the fun thing is doing uh, big events or big consumer tastings, we, we, we generally always pour both. And there's never, if we're pouring the same vintage, there's never really a big split between the crowd. There's maybe, you know, it's 60, 40 is maybe the biggest swing yeah. we get. Um, but it's, fu it's, it's fun to talk with people about why they prefer which one. Because you generally find out that like, people who like wines from the Loire Valley, go towards my stuff. Bordeaux, Napa people go towards you. And, mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just an interesting way to see how people's wine backgrounds kind of influence where their preferences go to. Yeah. 
And with my background, I think I like to watch people react to the wines before they even know that they're reacting. So they'll taste one and then they'll taste the other. And it's just like what we do. I'm like, well, this is pretty. Oh, you know, it'll just, yeah, no, it'll just go funny. back and forth. Now, um, we, we were talking earlier about the Drom family. Um, and in the old world, folks come from generations of winemakers. So it's yeah. been in their family history for 10 generations. And then, of course, California with UC Davis, and um, you know, there's that aspect of it too. And then a lot of folks, you know, you have the retired investment banker who comes and hires the best wine maker around, and that sort of thing. So, what amid all of that competition, what made you confident that you could make this successful, starting out kind of in a new venture? We're like those that first generation back in the old world, you know? And we're like that kid that graduated with his master's degree and is working for some investment banker. We're a bit of everything, you know? We, yeah. But yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I, I worked for a lot of years trying to figure out, you know, like, what's the, what's the magic, what's the knowledge, what's the bit that you have to pay attention to? And got to the point where I was, where you know, I was pretty confident. I knew what I was doing, and I knew I'd make good wine. Um, it ended up, you know, then we started in '03, and it, I found out, wow, I knew things, but I didn't know everything. Um, but we knew what we liked. We knew good wine, and once you've gone through the winemaking process a few times, you you know where things go sideways. Yeah. And you know, you know, good vineyards too. Um, and that was the that was one of the real key things was when we started, we wouldn't have started this if we couldn't have landed some fantastic vineyards in the beginning because you you can't make great wine out of just okay fruit. Yeah, and and I want to say you know kind of like going back to where do we fit you know like we I I always think well we're genuinely winemakers we own the winery we own the business but we make our wine and where do we fit we're actually like really. We're pretty genuine. We're not wealthy. Oh, that's not, nobody cares about that. But anyway, you know, I think we fit because we find it so interesting. So we're the ones that um, can tell you about the wine. We can tell you. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I can, honestly, it's one of those things where I think about it. I, I can't imagine the luxury of being able to talk to your father and your grandfather about, hey, yeah. in the last 50 vintages, what did you do when you saw this? That would, I mean, it would be, that would be fantastic. We don't have that. Yeah. Um, but we have a lot of fr friends, some of whom have that. Um, and a lot of people we can call if something weird happens. Um, There's a place for all of us. Yeah. Now there are 470 and increasing wineries in Oregon. Do you um, kind of look over your shoulder or do you wonder how many wineries Oregon can sustain, or do you think about that at all? Or? I don't know what the number of those wineries are, it's just uh, businesses that buy bottles and put labels on them. I know there's a decent amount, and they cycle through every few years. Um, I think of all of those wineries, there's a certain percentage that makes Willamette Valley Pinot Noirs. And of those, I think, my gosh, we need more of those because the entire country is hungry for really good Pinot Noirs. And we travel around when we go out and sell, and, and they're hungry for that. We're a small state. How many people do we have here? You know, um, I don't think I'm not worried about saturation. And we all seem to kind of want each other to be successful. Do you um, do you th really think the uh, Willamette Valley fit among the best in the world? You know, folks compare to Burgundy and, and other places and... Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not Burgundy. We don't have the weather, we don't have the soils, but it's, in terms of places, I mean, we, we're still here in Oregon because we wanted to make Oregon Pinot. Because, honestly, other than Burgundy, it's the only place I'd make Pinot. Um, you know, not to diss our friends to the south, but you, 
one of the great things about here is it's a marginal cool climate, which is what really makes Pinot differentiate. And every year is a little bit different. Every little block is a little bit different. I don't just sit around and wait for it to be sunny for an extra 40 days and get some, some big ripe wine every year. Um, you get nuance and layers and subtlety that you, you, you can't get anywhere else besides, you know, places like, like Burgundy and I don't know, maybe, maybe New Zealand. And do we do it well here? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there's fantastic vineyards. Everyone, you know, it, the industry here is still really young, but people know how to grow Pinot here now. Um, there's lots of good growers. There's lots of great winemakers. It's it's truly one of those world class regions that's just kind of underrepresented and under known just because we're small. And and finally, what is it that um, about Pinot that has really caught? folks imagination you know there are people that are into wine but there are some uh, Pinot seems to command even more obsession among certain groups of connoisseurs and other varietals so what what makes it magical for you or what why do you make Pinot uh, and um, why do you think people are so interested in on the, on the con consumer side again I think it's like a really good novel a thick Book. You know, you, you spend time reading and understanding and you get, you get, the, there's like, there's so many nuances, there's just so much to pull, you keep going back to it. And it's not easy. So, you know, smart people like challenges. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's fun because it's difficult. Um, Oregon's not an easy place to grow Pinot because it, rains once in a while and you have like like this year you have cool years where you're standing around wondering how we're going to get everything right but it's it's those challenges every year that are that make it fun if it was just dialing in a recipe every year I'd go make beer 